of being transparent, which obviously doesn't help you at all. Um, that is possibly the worst dictionary definition ever. Um, and so if you look up the definition of transparent, um, and there are a lot of different uh, sort of takes on this, um, but the one that I think is most significant for what we're going to talk about is this notion of something being self-evident, um, that uh, when you learn something, that it's immediately presenting itself to you. Uh, I went uh, and started looking at the etymology of uh, the word transparent. And if you look at the French, um, it adds a new element. And that new element is that it's not just visible to you, but that it's easy to understand. So it's not just something that you can see, but you're comprehending what you're actually seeing. Western languages, you have this tendency for there to be uh, dual definitions in the word. And so the fourth definition is actually the opposite of what you would expect from all these other notions. Um, so that's that a thing is unnoticed. So of course, that's probably referring to uh, the physical entity that you're looking at. So if you're looking through a window, you're not noticing the window itself. Um, but do expect like kind and nice. Um, this word will probably go through a shift in about a thousand years time where it might actually wind up meaning the opposite of what it means today. The definition that we're interested in the etymology of the French is the fifth definition, um, that we're not hiding anything. So that adds yet another element. So we can see the thing, um, and there's this implication that we haven't obstructed your view of this thing, um, figuratively speaking, um, and that you're able to understand it. So now we have sort of a more cohesive idea of what transparency means in the figurative sense. And then the sixth is actually kind of interesting because this sort of hinges on understanding um, that it has the same meaning in several languages, which is that, so not only can I see the thing, not only is there nothing obstructing my view of my comprehension of this idea, um, and not only do I understand it, but everyone else in the world, in all other languages, would understand uh, the same thing. And so now if we look at the etymology of the English, uh, we get one more element here, um, which is reducing the chance of corruption. And that's with respect to transparency in an organization. And that's probably what I'm guessing, saving for those of you that came across the street and didn't have any preamble to this talk, I'm guessing everybody else had that sort of in the back of their mind um, with respect to the notion of transparency when you were coming here today. That we were going to talk about organizational transparency and not some higher, loftier philosophical notion of transparency. So at first glance, transparency seems to be all about observation. Something easy to perceive, self-evident, open, public, understandable. Um, but we have to question that when we start to see this notion, right, that transparency, that something visibility is reducing your chance of corruption, you have to ask how. Well, why does seeing something prevent it from being corrupted, right? Those, those notions seem almost at odds with one another, um, observation and alteration, right? Um, and so I'm going to leave this as an open question for a moment. Um, so that actually ends uh, our history lesson on the word transparency transparent. Um, we're going to take a look at some extreme transparency. Um, so the very first one um, would be ultimate transparency, uh, the fire hose. And so here's where we're going to start talking about Nalenso just a little bit. If I gave you access to our Google Drive, which is where we keep all of our documents, whether they're uh, desktop uh, documents or online documents, um, and I could just say, you can see anything you want. Or like, go have a look. And, all of Nalenso's finances and all of Nalenso's emails and all of Nalenso's anything, um, that is a fire hose of information. You won't be able to make sense of any of that stuff. You won't be able to say, oh, okay, I'll just spend a Saturday looking through all of the emails of the past three years that you've sent and comprehend what your business is about. Or take a look at your financials in raw form, right? And be able to see, oh, okay, Nalenso is doing good financially, I guess. Um, and a better example would actually be the original WikiLeaks uh, cables release, or Cablegate. Um, so when they did this, oh well, okay, it went through some phases, but the kind of like burst of Cablegate, right, was about a quarter million cables. So if you, as an individual in the public, 
go out and look at a quarter million cables, you're not going to make sense of what that means, what it has to do with what was going on at the time, because these cables are spread out over time, right? So the various events in the world, what that meant for the US government, other governments, um, terrorist organizations, should there be any involved, right? This is going to be fairly incomprehensible to you, despite the fact that it's more or less all the information. So you have all the information, but you're not understanding it, right? So you have this notion of being uh, able to see and comprehend um, all of the details, but understanding isn't just uh, comprehension of the details, it's comprehension of uh, sort of the collective summary aggregate notion, right? Um, and so this is uh, tying back to this notion of things being obvious, um, and uh, I think that that implies that you have some sort of aggregate. This is a really, really good book, actually. It's very interesting. Um, so I like to think that Nalenso is an interesting organization, but it doesn't even come close to Ricardo Semler's uh, Semco. So as a little tiny bit of history, since nobody's read it, um, Semco was uh, it's a manufacturing company uh, out of Brazil, and Ricardo Semler inherited it from his uh, father uh, when he was fairly young, um, and he inherited it right before the uh, Brazilian recession. So essentially, he got this huge company, and then Brazil started to tank, and he couldn't really compete on an international market. Uh, the business was failing completely, and so he essentially just tried random things. And he was like, what if we let people pick their own salaries? What if we let the workers in the factory bring in plants and paint the walls and do whatever they want and try and just make people happy and see if that makes them more productive? And as it turns out, it did. Um, Semco is... Uh, still a viable business and actually they've sort of become this weird consulting business where like the CEOs of GM and Ford and GE and all these huge megacorps go to visit him and be like, how to teach us how to do this, which of course is very difficult for them. Um, so he's done a lot of other things, but one of the things that he did, um, or that he and uh, everyone who was sort of running Senco at the time did collectively, um, was to release all the financials of the company to everyone within the company. So if you worked at Semco, you would know um, all the profit and loss, uh, all the, the everything about everyone's salaries, everything that was going on internally um, financially. Um, but of course, not everyone's an accountant, right? So if you get access to all the financials, you're in as poor uh, a spot as if I gave you guys all the financials to Nalenso. And so what Ricardo Semler did was he set up courses, classes inside of Semco to teach everybody to read uh, the financial statements. So you could say, look, you can see the quarterly report and now because you understand accounting, because I've taught it to you, you'll be able to make sense of it. So that would be one approach, right? So you could teach everyone to read and we put in uh, parens there cables um, because you could learn about um, international policy and uh, economics and whatever else you need, war, right? <laughs> Everything you need to know to understand all those quarter million cables, but you still have to read all the cables. Um, so the other approach is the approach that Nalenso takes. Um, so all of our financials are also open to all of our employees. Um, they're not exactly open to everybody in the world. So uh, you guys actually can't at the moment go to our Google Drive and take a look at all our financial statements, but maybe one day. Um, and the way, that, the way that we do this is to uh, come up with sort of a dashboard. Um, and so this is a top-down approach where we can say, here are some pretty graphs. They don't take a whole lot to understand. Um, and if we want to go into the details, um, there's a what if tab here for uh, hypotheticals um, and uh, credit cards, petty cash, expenses, um, all these sort of breakouts that you can see exactly how we're doing financially. And so the way that this works, is that this gets sent out in an email a couple weeks before we do a quarterly financial meeting. And then we run uh, the financial meeting. Uh, Deepa actually stands up here and sort of goes, okay, is everybody understanding what's going on? New employees generally will need to be sort of uh, run through the explanation of what these charts mean. And then to the left, you can't see that because this isn't a scrollable spreadsheet or anything. Um, there's uh, all the numbers. And so you can actually play around with the numbers. You can switch to the what if tab. Um, and do some kind of future projections, uh, that sort of thing. And so everybody collectively in the room sits down and sort of plays with the numbers to see uh, what we can do, um, what's our sort of optimistic, pessimistic scenarios, like um, if there's a recession or uh, if all of a sudden our rates go up or something like that. But I mean, our business is consulting, so it doesn't actually change that much uh, quarter to quarter other than small growth. We're going to switch from uh, condensing information down in extreme transparency case number one, and I'm going to embarrass myself with extreme transparency 
Case number two. Donald Trump is put in the spotlight because people are paying attention to him. Um, and so that brings us to our sort of first philosophical question, right? Which is, there's actually a Wikipedia page, call, page called If a Tree Falls in a Forest, which I really like. And so the quote from this Wikipedia page is, um, does observation affect outcome? Right. So there's this question of consciousness that if no human beings or other animals that can comprehend what they're observing existed on planet Earth and a tree fell down, um, is there such a thing as sound? How do you define sound? Um, and I would venture a guess that if you removed the observers, right, you would not have a person like Donald Trump running for the American presidency. And maybe their democratic process wouldn't be the joke that it is right now. Are some people here familiar with the two slit experiment? Um, if you fire uh, particles um, at uh, a screen with two slits, um, they behave uh, as waves, actually, um, which is sort of odd, um, until you observe them. So here you can see um, before observation, uh, the particles are behaving as waves. If you put, it doesn't have to be a conscious animal or anything. If you put a camera, anything that can observe the particles, um, before the slits, so they observe which particle the slits are going into, um, the behavior actually changes, right? So at the time of observation, a particle um, actually collapses from a world of possibilities to a world of physical reality, which is, um, and it is this cute kitty with two different colored eyes. I don't know why he, he just came with the JPEG, um, but he's <laughs> observing the particles and changing their uh, physical reality as we speak. Um, so. Uh, this a wave to particle behavior is caused entirely by observation. It's not caused by any form of agency, right? We're talking about um, a space in which observation changes reality. The fact that I'm looking at you guys changes the fact of you guys sitting here, right? Which is a bit crazy. Um, and it leads people to sort of link up uh, science to spirituality a lot of the time, where you start to feel um, as though science itself is bleeding into a world of spirituality. And I think that. In many cases, that's actually a bit of a dangerous course to take. This slide is actually, um, so this is from a social experiment that BBC ran. Um, if you imagine a world in which uh, violence goes observed but unreacted to, right? So if everybody in the world was willing to see violence, those people who are participating in violence would be even less likely to conceal the fact that they are engaging in violence, right? Um, and so this is sort of the, the unwinding of the uh, change in behavior due to observation effect. If you observe but do nothing, um, it seems to imply uh, logically that um, those observed are no less likely to change their behavior. And so to kind of uh, tie this in to something a little more concrete. When I was a kid, uh, I was actually at the school where my father worked. He was the principal, but he also sort of managed all the computers. Um, and so I asked him, why don't you just use a compact disc? Because a compact, compact disc stores way more information. And so he explained to me, oh, I can't do that because I needed to create these floppy disks myself. And this was, of course, uh, the late 80s or early 90s, and uh, CD burners didn't exist yet. And so he explained that normally compact disks are read-only, that you need actually a factory to stamp the compact disks, and then once they're stamped, they can never be changed. Right? You can only see what's on the compact disc, you can only read it, you can't actually change what's on the compact disc. And that the floppy disks, by uh, comparison, are read-write. And so he can take a bunch of floppy disks and he can put Windows NT 3.5, again, not Windows 95, Windows, I'm not that young. Um, <laughs> I'm actually older than that. Um, take Windows uh, NT 3.5 and he can put it on all these 80 floppy disks, right? And he can use those floppy disks to install Windows NT um, on the secretary's computer, which was actually where it was. Um, and so there's this sort of dichotomy between this notion of observation and read-only things and the read-write world um, that I think is best called out in the world of computing, right? So on computers, it's very easy to make sense of uh, this distinction because it's very black and white, right? Computers don't have any sort of middle ground around whether or not if you observe violence um, but you don't do anything about it, whether or not the violence is actually changing. Computers um, are binary. So but let's go back to all of those notions and kind of collect them up. And even if we take the, uh, the quantum uh, case and we take the gross, uh, for both definitions of the word, uh, Trump case, and if we take the violence case, and if we take the computer case, we can maybe make this hypothesis, right? That without agency, 
boundless transparency is valueless, right? It just means that you're seeing all the things, but you're, you're not actually altering anything. So if you have some entity that can see all events, if you have something that's omniscient, but totally powerless to make any changes, that doesn't actually uh, change anything. Um, and so we have these three concepts, right? We have perception, which is to see whatever it is that we're being exposed to. We have understanding, which sort of follows from perception. So perception is meaningless. Um, if, for example, I was a newborn baby and I was standing in the same position, I'm not making sense of the colors and light and faces and things that I'm seeing right now, right? It's just blobs. I wouldn't even comprehend sound the way that I comprehend it at the moment. So perception alone isn't sufficient. You need understanding. Um, and from this notion of understanding, we can sort of conclude, maybe uh, tentatively, that we also need agency for transparency to actually mean anything to us. And then if we go back to this notion of alteration through the act of observation, um, we can suppose that agency uh, also requires perception. Uh, so you can't change things that you can't understand. And this is maybe actually, uh, it's possible that that should be a double arrow where um, agency and perception are um, inherently interlinked, the two of them. How have we avoided corruption? We haven't quite answered that question yet. But uh, I'll leave you with another uh, question, which is, why bother? What are the outcomes of having any form of transparency? If we look at the definition of the word secret, and I think everybody has sort of uh, different emotional responses to the word secret, right? Um, some, some possibly negative, some positive connotations to this word. Um, we can see that there's this notion of just keeping something unseen, right? Or wanting to keep something unseen at the very least. So if you have a secret, you are uh, preventing visibility. If we look at the definition of deceit, we see that it actually has a very similar def definition. So you're concealing something, some fact, um, from some observer, right? And I think that people's understanding of this word is a little clearer in that most people would consider deceit to have more negative connotations than secret. Oh, a secret, maybe it's justified, right? Maybe we're worried about privacy, maybe we're worried about someone's personal life. Deceit is, seems like we're in a little more worrying territory. And now if we get into more worrying territory, we can look at uh, the Sanskrit and Pali words um, that sort of mostly tie in uh, to kind of historical philosophies of some kind of Buddhism. Um, but we can take a look at this notion of truth, right? So both of these words, if, like the best translation you're going to get in English is probably truth or like something to that effect. But we see that for them, uh, for these particular philosophies that deceit or concealing something is actually untruth, right? And that untruth is a lie. And so from this philosophy, we're actually getting that secrets are untruth, potentially, and that secrets are lies, potentially. And so now we've sort of unified um, something that we consider almost, I think, ubiquitously negative, lying, um, and something that we're a little more uh, unsure about, uh, secrecy. I'm going to take a look at self-interest as the other aspect of transparency. What can you, what does transparency buy you? Because I think a lot of people sort of look at transparency, particularly organizational transparency, and they think of it as being something for other people. So I want my government to be transparent because I want to trust my government, not that it has any particular benefit to the government itself. Nalenso is an employee-owned uh, cooperative for some value of cooperative. So we are not uh, a capital C Indian cooperative because there is actually a legal restriction on those cooperatives that they can't do business uh, with companies overseas, which is sort of a non-starter for us as a software company. So uh, the way that we're structured is actually as an LLP, but every employee, um, and I'll come back to this, uh, every employee in the company is actually an equal partner uh, in the LLP. So it's an equal partnership between everybody who contributes to the company. Um, there's about 15 of us, again, depending on how you count. Um, and uh, I'll revisit this notion uh, after this slide. Um, so as I mentioned, all the financials within the company are transparent to everybody within the company. So there's this sort of uh, uh, availability within the walls of Nalenso, but um, not necessarily for all of you guys. Um, we do have a distinct preference for open source and open data. So these are another form of transparency where um, anyone who's using the software that you've built can see 
uh, everything that you've built for them or that they just happen to be using. Um, and similarly with open data, all the data that you've collected is available to um, any audience throughout the world, uh, unrestricted. Uh, but probably more importantly, um, we have uh, a policy, a uh, self-referential policy, of releasing um, all of our policies. So uh, we have a couple uh, fairly distinct policies that we've released. So one is um, salaries and our actual our process for going about deciding salaries within the company. So even though everybody owns Nalenso equally, not everybody takes home the same paycheck at the end of the month. Some of us have more experience. Some of us are just out of university. Um, and so everybody falls within a salary band. But that salary band itself uh, is transparent. And then we've tried to expose the process for coming up with that um, salary curve to everybody. So we've blogged about that and written about that. Um, the other fairly large policy that we have um, that we've written about and exposed to the outside world um, is our menstruation policy, which is um, is not the first by any stretch of the imagination. Um, there are actually countries that hold whole men menstruation policies, um, but it's actually uh, bringing the concept of menstruation um, in sort of uh, tangent to sick leave policy, which is where it usually lies. Um, and so the the crux of that policy is that. Um, menstruation and menstrual cramps are not illness, so it doesn't make sense to sort of take half of uh, your potential employee base and say, sorry, if you get menstrual cramps once a month, you have to take one sick day every month um, just because of a very totally natural process and something that actually doesn't have to do with healthcare or illness at all. Um, so that's also published online in fairly extensive detail with a long question and answer section. So we sort of posed it to the community. Our other discoveries we try to blog about as well. So a lot of this tends to be more internal. So uh, like technical things, um, stuff that we're doing on our weekends, stuff that has to do with software, um, software processes, not just kind of organizational policy. Um, but we also release uh, documents um, as much as possible. So we have a couple uh, repositories on GitHub that contain not source code. Um, so one is uh, the English classes that we teach to our operations folks. Um, so we're trying to get them um, fluent in English uh, and we've sort of structured our own set of English classes. So all of that has been released. Um, but more importantly, I, I think, um, is actually our LLP agreement. So the LLP agreement that defines us as an employee-owned cooperative we released that um, into the public domain. So there's no restrictions on how you use that document. You can take pieces out of it if the whole thing doesn't uh, suit you. And we released it as a template. So you can just fill in like my company name, uh, Inc. <laughs> or whatever. Um, and you could try and be a cooperative yourself or you could take some aspect of how we're structured as a cooperative. Um, and then something that's a little more concrete and, and that you've at least experienced a little bit today is that our office is essentially open to anyone. Um, so if people want to come work out of our office or stop by for lunch, uh, we usually just have them tweet at us or send us an email um, and we have people kind of coming in and out of the office all the time. Uh, and that's a little more physical. Um, but all of these things are effectively read-only, right? So all of these aspects of us as a company are just things that you can learn about Nolenso. Um, they're not necessarily things uh, that you can act on, either as an employee or uh, as an external observer. Um, and so it's a little more interesting to look at uh, how these things become read-write, right? How can we use some form of agency to alter this world that we're observing? Um, and so the, the first and most obvious is actually within the cooperative itself, which is that ownership implies control. So if you own one over n, where n is the number of employees of the company, um, that you control some portion of that company. Um, what's interesting is that you will never control enough of the company to set its direction entirely on your own, right? So we're somewhat constrained into a democratic environment. So we don't really have a choice but to do some form of democracy. In the early, early days, it was a referendum for everything. So like all eight or 10 of us get around a table and talk at uh, ad infinitum. Um, now it's a representative democracy, so we elect people into executive positions once a year. The transparent financials, and I've hinted at this, if we hold a finance meeting every quarter, um, 
it doesn't, I mean, it's, it's warm, fuzzy feeling to know how the company is doing financially and know whether or not you should be asking for a greater raise, right? Um, but agency comes from being able to participate in those conversations. So saying we should get better chairs or saying we should be contributing to charities or saying uh, we should cut back on our hours. We're actually making too much money. Who knows, right? Um, whatever the case may be, to move uh, the company in one direction or another requires conversation. And so um, that exposed uh, um, aspect of our financials isn't just about showing everybody the financials, but allowing them to participate in what structures those financials. Um, and so I mentioned uh, English classes, but there are a few other aspects um, to this whole world of read write um, that uh, are probably worth calling out. Um, so one, if anybody saw the terrace, one is the garden upstairs. Um, so this was sort of, uh, it came from a couple of places, but um, if you can see all the financials of the company, and if you know that you can participate in any conversation, people are not afraid to bring up things like this. So Jitu uh, doesn't work at Nolenso anymore, but it was actually his idea originally. Um, but I think his idea uh, came from uh, Kala, who helps us clean the office. Um, she just started putting plants in places, right? And she knew that nobody was going to be bothered by that, um, but she didn't do it sort of extensively. Then Jitu brought in a professional gardener to get more plants laid out and some more practical plants. So we have like tomatoes and lemons and, and things like that. Um, and then that's since grown as, as Kala's brought in uh, more um, plants and more pots and things. And so we've given her the money to sort of move in that direction. Um, the, the other things um, that sort of affect us as a company that people have fed back into the company are uh, things uh, like a preference for strong education. So educating the operations team uh, by teaching them English or by sending them to other classes. So Mintu, for example, is finishing his high school and we're helping him out with that. Um, but that's also education for everyone else in the company. So attending conferences, buying whatever books you want, uh, taking a university course if you feel like that would help you. Um, to keep people learning throughout their careers because we're sort of the first generation where that's absolutely necessary. And then the last thing would actually be remote work. So people's flexibility to work from home, to go visit their parents in Delhi and work from Delhi for a week or two, uh, work internationally um, wherever they happen to be located physically um, is something that everybody's fed back into the company because they knew that people would listen to them. Um, so if we look at the statement that I made, right? Nolenso is an employee-owned technology cooperative. Um, that is true for some value of true, and I think I've hinted at how it is not true a couple of times, but let's take a look at it um, more discreetly. So um, this is actually the breakdown of how people own Nolenso. Historically, if you think of most companies, this diagram would be reversed, sort of, or maybe it would be like the yellow guy on one side and everybody else on the other side, which is essentially that if I started the company, if I founded the company, if I own the company, and there's usually one, two, three of those people, um, they are the minority and they keep most of um, profit, control, uh, even the ability to observe things, right? Um, transparency. Um, here, we've moved most of the people into that category. Most of the people own the company, um, but not our operations team. So we have three folks that help us with cleaning the office, uh, kind of running errands, uh, doing some books. Um, those folks are actually not on the LLP agreement at the moment. Two restrictions here. One is that people, I think, have an understanding of the employee-owned notion as being knowledge worker-owned, right? So we are not your kind of classic cooperative where absolutely every employee uh, is immediately made a partner in the business or a member of the cooperative. Um, and some kind of get left as outliers for an extended period of time. The other is that they're not fluent in English yet, and the LLP agreement itself is written in English. You're sort of in this catch-22 position where you need to teach them English so that they can read and write and contribute to the LLP agreement and participate in it legally. Whether or not everyone will collectively decide if they should be on the LLP agreement over time, uh, I'm actually not sure. That would be my preference, but I, I don't know that it's everybody's. And so this would be a more accurate way to describe this, right? Nolenso is an employee-owned knowledge worker cooperative. So as long as you're a knowledge worker within Nolenso, which happens to be the majority in a design uh, project management software kind of company, um, then most of the employees own the company, but not everybody, right? Um, the thing is, is that it gets fairly complicated to start throwing this terminology around. And this is the difficulty with 
understanding, right, is that if you want somebody to understand the absolute truth of something that you're describing, you have to go into this sort of tiny bits of detail and call out every little exception. Um, and that's actually a bit difficult. And it actually flies in the face of the whole question of the fire hose, right? So now you're providing all of these little bits of information to everybody that you talk to and you're going to bore them to death with all of these uh, tiny bits. What you, what you really want is the aggregate. Um, and this is somewhat unresolvable. Taking a look at self-interest, um, if we are a knowledge worker cooperative, uh, which we are, then what we're interested in is convincing people to join us, right? We're still a corporation, we're still a company. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is by telling people that we're cooperative, right? So particularly people who've been in the industry for a long time, particularly people who may have gotten squashed or left out of an equity model in uh, a traditionally structured business, um, would be very interested in this, right? There's very little in the way of uh, the structure that we have that will allow you to be screwed, right? So you're very unlikely to be laid off unless everybody collectively decides we have to do some layoffs and we all understand that and we all do it transparently. transparently. But I, I sort of doubt that that would happen. It's probably more likely that we would re reduce our own salaries if we came to some sort of uh, financial discomfort. Um, the, the other thing is uh, this notion of control, right? You get to participate within the cooperative. So this is not alt altruism at all, right? This is totally self-interest where we're doing things in a slightly weird way and um, as sort of a side advantage of that, um, we get people who are more interested in our company. Um, now, this one is, I, I don't mean this to be as dark as it kind of looks, particularly with that eyeball. <laughs> um, this gives us some, some measure of attention, right? So like you guys are only listening to me talk about this thing because I happen to uh, be a part of this knowledge worker cooperative, which happens to have aspects of transparency, um, which I can tell you about. Um, and so uh, that actually gets more eyeballs on the company from, I mean, generally most of you probably won't be that beneficial to Nalenso as a corporation, right? It's more valuable if you go to a conference. I was just at a conference two days ago and when you tell people, it was like, oh yeah, we're an employee owned cooperative, whether that's true or not. Um, people are like, oh weird, how does that work? Because there aren't many technology cooperatives the world over, much less uh, in Bangalore. Um, and so that is kind of the, the various set of selfish reasons that you can act in a way that is transparent, um, whether it's read-only transparency or read-write transparency. Um, and I'd like to point out uh, a company that actually does transparency much better than we do. They're a social media company. They are extremely transparent, but they are extremely read-only transparent. This is a list of everything that uh, is transparent about Buffer. So the first two lines are all the things that you would expect, right? Like all the very standard, easy to sort of comprehend transparency items. And they tend to all be financial, right? So it's the equity model, who's getting equity inside the company, outside the company, who makes what salary, uh, how much revenue they have, um, their pricing model for you as the customer and where they're actually spending out of each dollar that they get uh, into the company, how that divides up in terms of how many chairs they buy and what conferences they go to, that sort of thing and uh, fundraising rounds when they're uh, looking for funding externally um, from their company. So all of that's fairly straightforward, but then these things are actually a little more interesting, right? So exposing the company's values. So what do we say that we're about and are we actually adhering to that or not? The books that they're reading, I think is kind of a neat one. So we have a library upstairs, but we don't tell anybody what's in our library. You have to physically come to the office and see it. So if you happen to be in Brazil, it's difficult for you to know uh, what books we're looking at. Emails. So if we are everybody that works at Buffer, any one of us exchanging email with anybody else, everybody else inside of Buffer can see your email. So email is no longer a private exchange, um, which has uh, kind of a lot of upside. Um, diversity metrics. So large corporations actually are not super interested in showing you these because they tend not to have women in high power positions. Um, they tend not to have an equal distribution of salaries between the sexes. They tend not to have that many minorities if you're looking at a very mixed country like the US or Canada. Um, and so starting with that as a principle means that if Buffer ever gets really huge, that that will still be a principle in their company, hopefully. And the fact that it's transparent now means if they ever close it down, people will know, right? And there might be some backlash. What all of this sort of uh, implies is that they're not afraid, 
right? The reason to keep this stuff secret is because you're afraid of someone seeing what's inside your company. Nalenso and, uh, and Buffer are sort of corporate models where transparency, we obviously participate in transparency because we feel like it's the right thing to do, right? Altruism doesn't go away, but we're doing it also for our own self-benefit. Um, because we see that to be the future of companies, that all companies will eventually need to be transparent, either by their own decision or possibly even because uh, the government is going to make it a, a law. So there are new um, corporate models uh, in the US in particular that are classic for-profit corporations um, which demand a certain amount of transparency from you as, uh, as the corporation itself. So you can choose these special models, they have certain tax breaks and things, but now you need to open a lot of the insides of your company up. Um, but if you take a look at nonprofits, um, so this is actually uh, the relatively new nonprofit um, that runs uh, events like the movie that we showed the kids um, for the one kid's birthday. And this is sort of a weird setup. It's not actually an orphanage. Um, it's a pastor in Coxtown. Um, and he takes these kids in because they've come to Bangalore. Uh, their parents are construction workers, so they can't stay with their parents because they won't be able to get to school every day. Um, so they stay with the pastor collectively. He sort of runs a hostel, but he doesn't have a whole lot of finances. Um, so folks uh, like us um, help them with finances, but the difficulty there is one of trust, right? So where you're a corporation, your trust is working in the other direction. You're generally afraid of people coming and finding your secrets, uh, discovering what you're going to do at the next conference, software that you're going to come up with, products that you're going to come up with. Um, as a nonprofit, it's quite the reverse. You're afraid that people aren't going to trust you, right? And people are shockingly untrusting um, of people who are asking them for free money, right? Um, and again, maybe it's not that shocking because there are a lot of scams in the world. Um, so what Nijirava has is, uh, a, a read-only uh, model for transparency, which is just that they have uh, a Google Doc and it's up online and you can go and see who's contributed uh, what finances to the organization, how they've spent it, um, which doesn't sound revolutionary, but it, it is actually fairly significant because were it not for that simple little document, you probably wouldn't trust them at all um, just to go and, and look at the place it's not exactly confidence inspiring, right? And partly because it's kind of this like weird ad hoc setup with this like pastor just housing these kids in his house. But apparently Nijarava means in Kannada um, like people of truth or voice of truth. So it's actually a significant part of their mission to make uh, what they're doing entirely transparent. The read-write portion of that, right, is not that um, you get to dictate what Nijarava is going to do with the money uh, that you donate, although maybe if you start um, participating, you can, but they get participation, right? So by being transparent, um, the agency that comes out of that is actually that people are willing to either donate money or donate their time. Um, so we've kind of gone through a series of ideas, these ideas being about perception and understanding an agency. Um, and then we looked at some concrete examples, right? So we've seen how, uh, how it actually works within an organization and why an organization would actually bother with this. I hope that that helps everybody uh, start coming up with their own answers as to how transparency helps eliminate corruption. Whether or not I would be completely honest with you about uh, Nalenso's structure or Nalenso's internals, um, if we were a corrupt organization, then maybe what does corrupt mean? Um, because that seems like a relative term as well. But to add one more layer of complexity, right? If T minus one is 2015 and T is 2016 and T plus one is 2017, nothing is going to be equally true in those time slots, right? And that's actually true at any granularity of time, not just year on year, but facts are only true for a certain point in time. You have now this difficulty of the breadth of information needs to be collapsed into an aggregate and you have to do your best about collapsing information into an aggregate without lying, right, or without lying uh, to the best of your ability. And now you have to make sure that what you're saying over time is true and continues to be true. Um, and that's actually uh, sort of on the head of the observer, right? So if you're watching somebody and they're telling you something, or they're showing you something, now you have to interpret what you're saying. And this becomes kind of a trust game again. But this is sort of the next level of complexity for um, transparency within 
uh, organizations. We've largely looked at um, the corporate world, right? The world of um, software companies specifically, but actually this is an image of a factory because I think that that would be much more interesting in some ways, right? So a software company has everything virtual and digital already, right? So it's very easy for us to give you guys everything that we have. You know, just say, oh, it's open source. Like just click the open source box or whatever. Um, it's much harder for a factory to do that, right? Or uh, a distribution channel, right? The supply chain, if that were transparent, that would be much more informative to us as consumers, particularly, or investors, right? So you could say, oh, okay, if I can literally see every step along the way that this phone came from a store in the US, but that came from a factory in China, and the materials came from somewhere in the Congo, um, and I know exactly what that entails, right? I might be less likely to buy a particular phone. Um, and there, uh, people are trying to carve through this, but not so much the corporations, right? It's a, to the corporation's benefit for you not to know that they're doing something kind of unpleasant behind the scenes, right? And that's usually at the source, right? For uh, manufacturing and distribution. Um, you're usually looking at like raw materials, the way things are manufactured, um, or potentially legal battles behind the scenes. Sometimes those aren't so visible either. But if we move away from corporations, whether they're open source corporations or not, sorry, this is the uh, OSI, is um, the open source, I forget what I said, Institute. Institute? Um, initiative? Thank you. <laughs> so that's their logo. I, I think that that's sort of representative of these uh, organizations that don't fall in any of these categories. Um, and they're sort of, uh, uh, one of these groups that would sort of be spearheading this, right? But we can start to look at um, governments as being, oddly enough, in some ways, um, sort of the leaders in this area. So um, the Indian government in particular has taken some very strong steps recently toward forced transparency, and transparency for sort of both of these definitions. So it, it very recently um, absolutely disallowed software patents. And it's hard to explain how significant that is um, to the software industry, but it means a lot for India, right? And uh, to kind of oversimplify it, right? Um, the majority of the world's patents last for about 70 years. If you think about how far computing and technology has moved in 70 years, if you imagine that somebody invented something really fantastic for humanity or society right now, right? The 2016. If you're waiting until uh, 2086 right, for that thing to become exposed such that other people can use it, you're not in a great position. You've created an artificial lag time that's just well beyond the current pace of progress, right? And so what that means is that all of these organizations, right, and I throw a religion in there just because I actually think that um, it is really tied up with almost everything else in a lot of ways that it, all of these organizations are going to start feeding into one another in terms of transparency, right? So if you have the Indian government saying, actually, software patents, not legit, right? Hopefully, uh, soon enough, they would say the same thing about um, genetic patents and agricultural patents, because that does a lot of damage to India, in my opinion. But once you, once you make that change at the governmental level, you effectively make that change uh, at the corporate level, right? And so it seems like if governments are interested in transparency in this way, they're interested in it for the sake of progress, right? You want people to lead better, healthier, happier lives on the whole. Everybody does, but nobody's really sure how to do this. Um, you can do it indirectly by forcing laws on corporations. You can do it directly by saying, oh, okay, the libraries, they need to be also transparent, right? They're a, a factor um, of the government quite directly. Um, schools seem like another place where um, you, you really shouldn't have an option, right? Transparency should be the default. Um, and there's this whole question of security and privacy, right? But that usually falls in at the, the individual level. Um, so not really talking about that so much as avoiding corruption at the organizational level. Um, but I think that with time, uh, all of these categories of organizations are going to feed into one another and you're going to see quite a lot more transparency and fairly radical transparency um, in the next five to ten years. So I actually don't think in many ways that what we're doing as an organization 
um, is necessarily all that extreme. I think that we could probably do a much better uh, job of it. But I kind of hope that we and maybe all of you uh, will sort of push in that direction as we start building out new, uh, more relevant organizations with um, our society as we reform it. Thank you.